for everything. Um, and thank you to ISI for having me. As Johnny said, I've employed, I don't know how many ISI kids I've employed um, a lot. And they're all smart. And more than that, they're all interesting. I, I think we underrate just how boring identity politics is. I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's an attack on Western civilization, but on a more prosaic level, it's just very tiresome. Because really, when you're talking about identity politics, what are you talking about? You. And as my wife often points out, there's nothing more boring than you. <laughs> talking about yourself <laughs> is, uh, well, it was the most offensive thing you could do in the world that I grew up in. Um, when my father would check our thank you notes as children, and we had a pretty undisciplined household growing up. I grew up alone with my dad, but the one thing that was very disciplined was thank you notes after Christmas and he would come in and inspect our thank you notes. And if you began more than one sentence with the word I, he made you rewrite it. And he would always say, oh, it's about you? Really, you gave the present? I don't think that you did. I think it's about the person who gave it to you. So why don't you talk about them? Um, and suddenly we have an entire country where, and I mean entire country, where our politics, our literature, our art is all based on me talking about me. It is narcissism at scale and it's, um, it's yawn-inducing above all. Uh, and the kids that we've had from ISI are interested in something beyond themselves, like Western civilization and the ideas that formed it and the faith that formed it. And so they're super interesting to talk to. You know, I don't fall asleep. And at, at my advanced age of 54, like, I don't like young people that much, honest, to be being honest. And because, you know, old people don't like young people as much, right? But most don't like them because it's, it's not interesting. They are all interesting. They have something to say. They're engaged in the ideas. And so it's been a thrill uh, to have them. So I was thinking about what to say, and uh, you know, I could go and do my normal litany of how terrible things are, but that's not necessary in a room like this because everyone already knows. The question is, how did this happen so quickly? And I was thinking today, um, I was pulling in a Bryant Pond in my truck with my dogs this morning, I was thinking, it wasn't even 20 years ago I got fired, well, the first time, one of many times now, um, but, and I had four little kids in school and I had to make money and so I went on the road giving speeches. And my debate partner for much of those years was a guy called James Carville, who, uh, well, you remember James Carville, ran the Clinton campaign in 92, large, bald, reptilian, demented guy from Louisiana, Stephanie Speakman! It's a, I gotta say one thing, by the way, Wilmington is one of my favorite places in the world. And I must, I don't know how many people I know who are from here, but I show up here and I got like 20 texts, come stay with me. It's like the densest collection of nice people, I think, of any place in the world. And um, no, it's true. My, my daughter is actually dating a boy from Wilmington. And so all of my children come down for, what is it, your spring party and your winter party? Do I have that correct? Whatever. Wilmington gossip suffuses my dinner table. Um, anyway, I go on the road with James Carville, and he used to do this routine about how he was a liberal, but liberals were kind of nuts. You know, he'd be speaking to business groups or Wall Street before they all went crazy. And they were sort of all kind of sensible center-right money people. And Carville was a representative of the Democratic Party, which at the time they kind of distrusted. This is pre-Obama. And, um, and he would always say, he would say, my party's crazy. Next thing you know, we're going to have a transgender amendment. And people would always kind of like, stop. What the hell could that be? And I remember some speech, J.P. Morgan's speech in Napa, and somebody said, what's a transgender amendment? He goes, how the hell do I know? There's something the liberals would propose. And everyone laughed, like that was so prima facie insane, a transgender amendment. Well now, I mean, I don't think there's a spending bill that doesn't have a transgender amendment attached to it. And that wasn't that long ago. It happened so fast. I could give you a thousand other examples of how American society has changed almost overnight. I was in Abu Dhabi last week. And, I mean, just being honest, it's like a freer society than ours. You can say, uh, unless you're an Islamic extremist, in which case, shut up or be beheaded. Other than that, you can kind of say what you want. And it's true, I was just there. They have a bigger and more explicitly Christian Christmas program in Abu Dhabi than they have in New York. If you told me 20 years ago, you know, if you really want to taste freedom, go to the Gulf. Go to some primitive theocracy. <laughs> you know, obviously it would have been like the transgender amendment. I would have laughed derisively. Like, that's nuts. So the question is, how did that happen? And so fast. And it happened for two reasons, really. 
One is that only one side in the revolution recognized that it was a revolution. The other side had no idea. They're like, things are getting a little flaky. You know, first they banned smoking on airplanes, the next thing you know, they're giving you medicine you don't want. Like, they, they just couldn't kind of see that as part of the same continuum, though it is, honestly. One side saw these changes for what they were, which were a revolution. Let's completely change American society from the bottom to the top. Let's eliminate any sense of shared culture or history. Let's atomize the country to the point where there's no viable opposition to what we're doing. And then once we've done that, let's like addle everyone with prescription drugs. Let's encourage them to be unhealthy and unmarried and childless. And then we can kind of do whatever we want. And no one sort of on the other side, which is not just the right, by the way, it's not just the, I think the academic right, which is small and mostly in this room, understood what was going on. <laughs> but the vast bulk of everyone else, which would include like a lot of Democrats and just like normal people who aren't that interested in revolution or at all interested in revolution, who at best want incremental change, they had no idea what was happening. So there's that. It's important to understand the moment that you're in and it cuts against the very core of human nature to understand it because I am totally convinced at my age that denial is the most powerful of all human instincts. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, honestly, I was, was 22 years ago, next month, I was uh, in a plane that crashed, amazingly, in the Middle East, flying from Peshawar, Pakistan, the Khyber Pass was right after 9-11. I was going over to cover the Taliban and something happened in the cargo hold and we went down in the sand dune in Dubai. Obviously, I survived, but it was a Pakistan International Airways flight, and the thing that changed my life about that experience was something happened horrible to the plane. Like, there was an explosion in the cargo hold, some debate about what it was, but it happened, and the plane starts dropping, and the wing appears to detach, the right wing, and the plane is, like, struggling for altitude and going up, gunning the engines and sideways. It's like 3 in the morning over the Arabian Sea. People are freaking out on the plane. Every person on that plane thought we were going to die, very much including me. I had three little kids. I was half drunk, which makes it worse. <laughs> and we finally come in kind of sideways into the sand and the plane's on its side. And I'm in the first seat on the plane. It's a big double Airbus. And I just had one thought, which is I'm getting off the plane. And it's, you know, totally dark. And you can see burning from the wing. So it's like, it is time to depart the plane. So I hop up. And this male flight attendant stands right in front of me and goes, sit down, everything is fine. Everything is fine. <laughs> That's a verb and a quote. Everything is fine. It was so demonstrably unfine, I, I can't even begin to describe how unfine it was. <laughs> and I think just out of pure panic, I like ignored the guy and I opened the door and the slide went up and I jumped into darkness with like four other Westerners in the front. Everyone in the back though, they were like, oh, everything's fine. And I thought, I've brooded on that for over 20 years. Like, why did he claim everything was fine? The pilots, by the way, went right out the front windows. <laughs> well, they did. Oh, absolutely. Like, whatever. Good luck, guys. Um, and I think he just couldn't metabolize the change. It was so awful. He just could not admit what was happening right there in front of everybody. And this really bothered me all these years, despite the fact it wound up fine for me. By the way, the plane is now a dive site off the Burj Hotel in in uh, Dubai. You can swim through it, someday I will. Um, but then last year I read the biography, which I would recommend to everyone in this room, of Peter Rangel, who was the leader of the revolutionary r white forces during the Russian Revolution, um, the Civil War, rather, that came after the revolution. And he was a Baltic German living in Russia and a, a general worked for the Tsar. The war ends, or Russia ceases its hostilities with Germany, he comes back to, to St. Petersburg, and the country's in complete chaos. And the Bolsheviks have decided that, you know, it's, the, it's discontent within the army that we need to inflame, and we need to get the army. I don't know if this sounds familiar to anyone here. Uh, but get the guns, and the people who wield the guns. We need them. So the first thing they do is destroy all discipline in the Tsar's army, complete. So Peter Rangel's just been on the front for four years. He comes back into St. Petersburg, totally civilized city, two-hour drive from Helsinki. I mean, it is Europe, okay? Whatever anyone tells you. And he's wandering through, and soldiers are going crazy in the streets. 
and they're raping women, they're stealing at gunpoint, soldiers in uniform in a monarchy which had not had any behavior like this at all. And he, Peter Engel just can't even believe it. These are his soldiers. He's a general. And so he's, he's completely freaked out, and he goes into a movie theater, and everyone in the movie theater is completely absorbed in the movie. Like there's no revolution happening outside. And Peter Engel thinks, these people are insane. So he goes back. He's like, i got to get to Moscow. So he takes the train to Moscow. I have to tell the czar, this country's falling apart. He's very close to the Romanovs, the family. You should read this. It's, it's just out in English translation in the last three years. It's an unbelievable book, lost to history until recently, to English speakers. So he goes back to Moscow, and he's close to the Romanovs. And so he goes into the imperial court, and he knows all the relatives, and there are millions of them hangers-on. And he notices about 80% of the women in the Romanov family are wearing red ribbons in solidarity with the Bolsheviks who wound up, of course we know how it ends, murdering them. Murdering them in the basement at dawn. So, wait, what? Peter Rengel says, how is it that this country is being devoured by a violent revolution and the people who can afford movie tickets, that is kind of our middle class, are refusing even to acknowledge that it's happening and the ruling class against whom it is aimed are sympathizing with it. And if this doesn't remind you of BLM, I don't know what does. I'm reading this in my porch. Like, midnight, I couldn't go to sleep. I was like, wait, I live in that country. That's happening now. This is a revolution. Its aim is to hurt you. Yes, that would include physically in the end. Sorry. If someone tells you you're not allowed to speak, if someone tells you your children are not your children, Okay. These are not ideological differences. This is not, oh, I prefer you know, this capital gains rate. These are totalitarian measures that treat you as non-human. Human beings, free citizens, get to say what they think. Slaves must be quiet. That's the distinction. So all this like, oh, it's in the First Amendment. No, no. Yeah, it precedes the First Amendment, as our founding documents make clear. These are natural rights that distinguish the citizen from the slave the human from the subhuman. We can't consider slaves fully human or we wouldn't enslave them. So anyone treating you as a slave considers you less than human. People don't pause to consider the implications of this. If someone says to you, I have a right to make your children hate you or to say weird, creepy sex stuff to your kids, what's, your, what's a valid response to that? Well, in a healthy society, if someone says weird, creepy sex stuff to your eighth grader, you get your gun. Like, try that in Bulgaria. How do you think that's going to work? I mean it, too. Oh, you're calling for violence? Yeah. You try and sexualize my children? What? Those are my children. That's totally not allowed. That's not, that, nothing like that is allowed. And I don't care if you claim you're a teacher or an administrator, you work for some creepy Soros-backed NGO. If you're trying to sexualize my children, I go right to force. And if I can't do that, I'm not really their father, am I? I'm serious. And I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of in that. And no, I'm not calling for, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm calling for applying natural law to American life. And if you refuse to do that, what happens? Well, we're watching what happens. They become increasingly aggressive. The Aims are exactly like the means, totalitarian, period. This is not a debate. They don't want a debate. They've said that explicitly they don't want a debate. So I really think that we should begin to see this for what it is, which is a very big deal on which all depends, not just our republic, but like your family. And I'm not calling for stockpiling ammo, though. I mean, I don't, you know, no one ever went broke doing that, I can say. Maybe some have, but they'll get it back in the end. It's a good investment. Um, what I'm calling for is approaching this moment with the seriousness that it both deserves and requires. It requires. So that, you read that beautiful letter from, was it Lieutenant Blue? After whom a, a spectacularly dysfunctional public high school in Washington, D.C. is named, I should tell you. Poor guy, that's his legacy. <laughs> boys' room shootings. Um, but you read that, and you realize a couple of things. One, 
this man was not lying to himself. He knew that everything hung in the balance. He was in the middle of a civil war and he wasn't pretending otherwise. I mean, it was literally a civil war, but he knew that it was. It's one thing to be in a civil war, it's one thing to admit it. And he did admit it, okay? The second thing was his grave seriousness. His grave seriousness. This man foretells his own death in that letter. I can feel it, I'm about to die. Not an inkling of self-pity at all. Not even any, I mean, if I thought I was gonna die, I would write the world's treacliest letter to my wife. You're so great. He said, I'd rather die than be dishonored. He says that in the letter. This is a very serious person, maybe even a little self-serious, actually. And we're not prepared for self-seriousness because we all, at least if you're my age, grew up in a world where self-seriousness, or even seriousness itself, was the gravest of all sins, taking yourself too seriously. You have no ironic detachment. You can't laugh at yourself. You can't laugh at the moment. Well, I mean, I'm big on ironic detachment. I'm, I try. I'm big on humor. I really hope, you know, that when I get the diagnosis, you know, that I'll be man enough to joke about it. I really do hope that. On the other hand, it's not just about me and whether I can show coolness under pressure or tell a joke facing stage four. It's bigger than that. It's about my children and the grandchildren I fervently hope to have. And their lives require me to be a little more serious than the world I was raised in, which was honestly not serious at all. It was a very decadent world. I didn't recognize that at the time. You know, sort of well-educated, upper-income America, very decadent, actually. Well, I'm, who am I to judge? Well, you know, on the one hand, okay. Who am I to declare myself better than someone else? I'm with that to this day. I don't, th I don't think I'm better than anyone else, and actually I've got a lot of evidence that I'm not. On the other hand, it is for me to judge whether something is good for my country and my children. That is my duty to judge. And not to make light of it, but to see it for what it is, which is the choice between life or death, literally. And so I, here's how I think we should respond. First, by taking stock of ourselves. I mean, are we actually living lives that prepare us for whatever is coming next. And here's how you know this is, this is like a process that's imminent, not far away. We have a presidential race that's on the books. And I mean, I could go on for hours about that. The truth is I don't know what's gonna happen and that's kind of the point. I spent my whole life looking at this stuff, making predictions, winning bets, winning a couple pretty good vacations on making obvious, you know, obvious bets about who's gonna win. Like, no, Al Gore's not gonna be president. Look at the guy. I want a lot of money on that. This election, we have a president who's, well, I'm not being mean, but is senile. That's just true. And I feel mean every time I say that, but it's true. And who is literally losing to a candidate who's been indicted four times on 91 felony counts. Donald Trump has been indicted four times. Now, I think if you look at the counts, and I'm not here to flack for Trump, mixed feelings about Trump, but I'm just being honest. If you uh, spend a day reading it, it's ridiculous. So they've done everything they can by legal means, which are in fact extra legal means, if we're being totally honest, completely third world stuff, to take the opponent out of the race and they're still losing. So, I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen. This is not gonna be a race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I would bet my beloved fishing camp in Maine that that is not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. So what will happen? Well, I don't know. One of like 400 distinct other possibilities? I mean, I just can't even, you know, pick one. By the way, if it's Gavin Newsom, we all should be very, very concerned. That guy's scary and I mean it. I mean it, it's scary. Yeah, but that's a whole separate conversation. But the point is, this, is, this will be forced. These issues will be forced soon, like in a year. And the road from here to November of 2024 is going to be filled with developments nobody in this room could foresee. I can promise you that. So it's about to get very serious, uh, for sure. It's, you know, it's only leadership of the world at stake, which is also, by the way, we now know the most lucrative possible political franchise in human history. So everything's at stake. What wouldn't they do? What haven't they done? What might they do next? Let your imagination run wild. So the question, the only one that you can answer is, how will you prepare yourself for that?
And because that really is the only question. And, and I mean, I just, my, my answers to that in my own life, I'll just tell you what I think. One, be a little bit more serious. You know, like, take this seriously. Much as you want to retreat and pretend everything is fine, sit down. It's not fine, okay? Two, you know, maybe if you look across at the people you despise, the small group of people running this country, it is small, it does not represent most people in America, it doesn't represent anything close to a majority at all. Again, just to restate, Donald Trump, who is hated as a blood enemy by over 40% of the population, and who's been attacked in ways that no political figure's ever been attacked in the West, is beating the incumbent president, okay? I'm not sure that's entirely an endorsement of Trump. To some extent it is, and his empathy, that's real. But it's also a sign of revulsion, deep dissatisfaction with what we're doing. So most people are not on board with this. But the people who are responsible for it are the most dishonest, the most ruthless, the most anti-human group I've ever dealt with. And I spent 35 years living in Washington. I don't even recognize these people and what they're doing. I really don't. It's so dark. They're doing things that can't even, on an academic level, conceivably help the United States or the population that lives here. Letting in 7 million people from the poorest countries in the world illegally and then immediately putting them all in public benefits? I mean, that right there will destroy the country. And they did that on purpose. So these are really, really dark people, the darkest. So I need to be the opposite of that. And I'm not a super good person. The last thing I would do is claim to be. But this is, this is the moment to try a little harder to be a little bit better. This is not the moment to be drunk all the time. This is not the moment to tell lies. As they go lower, go higher. And there are many reasons for this. And one is spiritual, let's be totally honest. I do think this is a spiritual battle. There's no political explanation for it whatsoever. But one other reason is for the way that you feel about yourself. When you're honest, you are proud of yourself. When you're honest, you are strong. When you lie, you become weak. That is true. Tell a lie, you become weak. Why do you lie? Because you're hiding something. Because you believe that the people around you knew what you really thought or said or did, they would think less of you. That diminishes you. Your power ebbs when you lie. Tell the truth. Live like a decent person. Try. I mean, it feel, you really feel like Cotton Mather just saying that out loud. It sounds so radical, but it's not. And gather your family to you in a real way. If you've got a dispute with a sibling or a parent or a child or the person who shares your bed, do your best to make it better. Spend less time on Twitter. Spend more time talking to your wife. I mean it. Strengthen the core, and the core is your family. It's the orbit right around you. I, I, I believe very, very strongly, more than almost anything, in the concentric circle theory of love, which is when you love people and you help them, either with your time or your empathy or your advice or your money, it should begin at the closest level to you. So I'm not sending a single dollar for mosquito nets in Congo until my wife is happy with me. I mean it. I mean it. And I'm not, I'm not going to worry about the children until my four children are in a good place and until I've called them every single day. And I'm not giving any more money to the Episcopal Church until my housekeeper gets a new car. I mean it. She's my housekeeper. She's cleaning my toilets. I, I'm serious. And so think of yourself, particularly for the head of household, as and not in an egotistical way, but in a very practical way. Like it all radiates out from you. Like make sure that the in close relationships are good. Spend all your time on that until they are. And in so doing, you become stronger. Your family becomes stronger, and I'm using family in a very loose sense because a lot of people don't have at this point, and this is a product of policy, intentional, don't have nuclear families. I'm so blessed to have one, but many people who I love don't, including my own children. But your family and the people that you have real relationships with, 
And what's a real relationship? A real relationship, a fake relationship is when you're talking to someone and you tell the truth about other people. Oh, she's such a bitch. Oh, we're close, okay. No, that's a fake, re that's a relationship with you have with your hairdresser, okay? It's a fake relationship. A real relationship is when you tell the truth about yourself. That's the acid test. Do I have a real relationship with this person? Am I willing to admit who I really am? And it's those relationships you strengthen. And the more you do, the stronger you get. So that's the first thing. Take stock of your own life. Try to be virtuous. I know it sounds so dopey. I'm way too Episcopalian even to have these conversations, but it's real. Live in a way that you're proud of. And the prouder you are of it, the less they're gonna mess with you. You stand a little tall, well, you can't mess with me. I got my household squared away, back off. Touch my kids and get hurt. Like, that's how people with self-respect behave. People with no self-respect are all like, I don't know, the therapist said maybe. <laughs> what? Who's the get out of here, you freak? You're a therapist? Be gone. Have you dealt with them? You know what I'm talking about? The school people, well, the school therapist. First of all, you shouldn't have a therapist, weirdo. Anyway, whatever, don't even get me going. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, and I'll stop with this because now I'm really wound up. And Johnny's gonna calm me down. We're gonna have like a civilized, more academic conversation. Um, but the second thing is, be brave. I mean, it's like, it's actually not that complicated. I think about all the people I admire, and there are so many, and um, I, you know, like a lot of people who like to read a lot, I have a fetish for smart people. Oh, he's so smart. You know, it's like a massive compliment of my family. He's so smart. Oh, he's so smart. I can promise you after spending, you know, 35 years living among valedictorians with HBS degrees, immaterial, immaterial. The people I admire are not the smartest. Some of them are. I think most of my friends are smart. All my kids are smart. My wife's smart. Great. My dogs are stupid. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful people. I mean that. Intelligence is not the measure. It's not the measure of your moral value. And it's also not, and this is an, this is an insight that came to me late in life, it's not a measure, a predictive measure of your effectiveness. Can't, you know, if you... If you gave IQ tests, which by the way, sorry guys, are real, to a class of sixth graders, and then followed them longitudinally, this has been done actually, like how'd they do? And the smartest kid, probably working a Jiffy Lube, died of a drug OD, like that's not actually a predictor of success. I'll tell you what is, bravery. And it's a combination of factors, but the person who's brave wins, period. And in a moment like this, the stakes are higher. It's not just a matter of like being the next guy who invents something cool and then figures out a way to sell it. No, it's do you want your children to be able to live here? Do you want to have grandchildren at all? And if you're not brave, that won't happen. And that's very clear at this point. And I could, boy, I could bore you with a lot of dark stats, but I'm not going to because you know them. And so be brave. And by the way, there's nothing easier the key to being brave is brooding about death. I'm, I'm, this is just true, I believe. The key to being brave is brooding about death. All anxiety and all fear stems from the most basic of all fears, which is the fear of death, which is inborn. You feel it from the moment you arrive because you know it's gonna end on some level. My deepest child on her fifth birthday burst into tears and I said, why? All my other more shallow children were psyched for the cake. <laughs> my deep child, said, well, I, I don't want it to end. And I said, what? My life. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I could drown in these waters, they're too deep. I did start crying, yes I did. Okay, I'll admit it. Um, but anyway, but whether we articulate it or not, that is the root of all anxiety. And so you need to focus on that. And I grew up in a place when I was a kid called La Jolla, California which had a lot of, I know someone just snickered, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, has a lot going for it, it's beautiful and all that. But in retrospect, the one thing that made it a really bad place actually to grow up and to live and why I don't visit anymore is there was only one taboo in La Jolla and in all kind of affluent towns like La Jolla in the West, which is death. It's like the one thing you could not talk about. I mean, people, people had freaky sex situations in La Jolla that would, even in Wilmington, you'd be shocked by it. And I'm serious, okay? <laughs> it's a little inside joke for people from Wilmington. Oh. 
Anyway, sorry, uh, but you would be. Like, there, nothing was judged. Like, well, I ended up, you know, marrying the babysitter, but then I brought the massage therapist in for some polygamy, and people were like, oh, that's cool, really? Yeah, no problem. No judgment whatsoever, none. The one thing you couldn't do was talk about dying or any of its attendant symptoms like aging. No aging. And if you got old enough and your, and your age was visible enough, you had to go to Palm Springs. You had to, no, I'm serious. It was our equivalent of putting you on the ice flow. Okay, like the Inuit do. Sorry, you're all, you just, you know. And it's like, whatever happened to Mrs. So-and-so? I don't know. She was in her 450 SLC just driving, driving east. Never saw her again. And she's in Palm Desert at Thunderbird or whatever. And now she's, you know, you, you don't know. But the one thing you could never say about Mrs. So-and-so is she died like we all will. Totally not acceptable. And as a result of that, beneath, and if those of you who've lived there or know the area or any town like that, I, I doubt Aspen or Jackson are any different, right? The one thing about those towns is the anxiety level is crazy high. And that's why everyone's on benzos. Or like climbing to the stop of, top of Snow King manically or whatever, doing so much cardio that they calm down. I, I'm not joking. Anyone familiar with the culture I'm talking about? The white wine, now Casamigos, it's changed, but whatever, same idea. There's a crazy amount of anxiety because no one can acknowledge the core truth of life, which is that it ends. And any attempt to even talk about this or engage in a, like a religious discussion, which by definition implies death and powerlessness, was rejected as like repulsive and an attack. And it made everyone crazy and it made them cowards. That's true, it made them cowards. So as long as you're afraid of that, you're not gonna be very effective fighting against people who really are serving a cause they believe is larger than themselves. Now I think it's Satan or whatever you call it, but it doesn't matter what I think, they believe they are acting on behalf of something larger than themselves, the revolution. And if you're just like, make it go away, I don't wanna be uncomfortable, you're gonna lose. And the consequences are gonna be horrible, probably not for anyone in this room, because like everyone here is kind of higher income and older like me, but certainly for your kids, there's like no chance they'll prosper in a country like that, there's no chance. And your grandkids, I mean, they'll just be like texting each other, where can we move, where can we move? Oh, nowhere. So it's essential not to be afraid to die. And once you decide, I'm really not afraid to die, nothing scares you. Like what's scary at that point? Bring it on. Oh, you're gonna criticize me on Facebook. You're gonna bring suit against me, you're gonna arrest me, you're gonna kill me, so what? Go ahead. And I would make two arguments, and I'll stop with this because now I'm really getting crazy, but I mean it. <laughs> I would make two arguments on behalf of not being afraid of death. And the first is just an obvious mechanistic argument that I think everyone, regardless of religious faith, can understand, which is you're gonna anyway, and it's gonna be horrible. So like, why not? You're playing with the house money. And I would recommend one of the greatest essays I've ever read was by George Orwell, uh, written in, uh, as part of a book he wrote called Down and Out in Paris and London, but he winds up in a hospital in Paris in the 30s during the Depression with tuberculosis. George Orwell was a man of, of famous and proven physical courage. He was shot in the throat by a sniper standing guard during the Spanish Civil War on the wrong side, unfortunately, but whatever, he was trying. Uh, and. Uh, and didn't mention it in his diary. Didn't mention it in his diary. I mean, this is a man who had, you know, went to Eton, you know, in 1913, was, grew up rough in the way that the British upper classes used to raise their boys, in a martial way, actually. And he winds up in this, pool, in this hospital for the indigent, and he's in a huge bay, like the size of this room, filled with metal cots, and people all around him are dying. But they're not dying of anything interesting. They haven't been shot in the throat by a sniper, with eight million of your mouths around, they're dying of like diarrhea and the flu. And he describes in this wonderful essay how horrible it is. And he has this line there, he says, you know, there's so many tears shed for guys who die, you know, during the Great War, which is only 10 years before, 20 years before, going over the top of the trench and getting mowed down by a 50 cal. And he goes, that's very sad. Obviously, he grew up in a world where all the men were killed that way. 
But he goes, that's kind of nothing compared to the way the people around me are dying. Like, it's going to be bad no matter what. You might as well die with your shoes on doing something you believe in. That was Orwell's conclusion. In the end, he died of tuberculosis alone. At, at he, but whatever, he didn't get to choose. None of us do get to choose, but we can have the mindset that frees us from the anxiety over something that we can't change, that's gonna happen, and at very best, we can imbue it with meaning. That's the point, that's the choice we have. We're gonna die, should it mean something? Should our life mean something? That's the only choice we get to make. The rest of it is out of our hands. And the second point I would make is something that, you know, I've come to very slowly over many years, but I mean, let's just be totally real. All the religion stuff, basically true. It's basically true. It is. And this is the only civilization that I'm aware of in all human history, and I mean the West post-war. So the last 80 years in the Anglosphere and Western Europe is the only civilization in history that has proceeded on any other assumption but there is a god or gods. It's like, th that's a brand new thing. And it turns out, actually, spoiler alert, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, it doesn't work at all. There was something about the atomic bomb going off, in my opinion, that completely changed people's assumptions. And I think that display of godlike power gave people the false impression that they were gods. That's my personal belief. I've never heard anybody say that, but I sincerely believe that. But whatever it was, post-war, our assumptions about the universe changed. And I think in retrospect, we look ridiculous. But nobody else has assumed that. From the Hivero Indians at the Amazon headwaters to the, to the Swedes. And by the way, thank you for hiring Swedes. No, nobody does. Um, you know, the most secular nation in the world they were fervent evangelists until about 20 minutes ago. I mean, this is a brand new world that we live in. Not just secular, I mean, that began hundreds of years ago, but a civilization whose core assumption omits the possibility that we're not the most powerful force in the universe. See, this never happened. And so, I mean, you could even, like, just do the law of averages here. Are we right? Or is every other human being who's ever lived right? So it's Kamala Harris versus all history. What do you think? And I'm kind of thinking the overwhelming evidence lands on the yeah, there is a God, and this is not the end. Nobody's ever not thought that. And so if you're willing to kind of roll the dice on that, considering you're gonna die anyway, there's really nothing to be afraid of other than cowardice. Living as a slave, hating yourself, being held in contempt by those closest to you, living without purpose, those are the things to fear. So I will stop with that and just say, take heart. Take heart. Your bravery is scarier to the other side than any weapon you could marshal. They melt in the face of it. They've only advanced this quickly because they've met no resistance at all, because everybody is a cucked coward. Oh, I don't want to make anybody mad. Yeah, really? You know, it stops here. If you had 10% of the population take that posture, this crap would end immediately. That's it. That's all it takes. And I hope that we will. Anyway, thank you very much. So we're running a little over on time, but how many of you want to hear a little bit more from Tucker? A little more? Woo! All right. Thank you. We're gonna, do you want the parchment? Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, all right. I, can I just say, I'm sorry for sounding like an extremist. I, I don't mean to. I'm, I'm actually the most temperamentally moderate person I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate change of all kinds, and I, and I don't seem to, I, I don't want to seem like a nutcase, but I, I just feel like the stakes are high. Yeah, the stakes are high. So I think I, the place that I want to start is with this focus on the elites or the ruling class yes. that you keep talking about. Because I, I think a lot of people hear you legitimately railing against 
all of our institutions and the individuals running them, and they think that you're, that you're a populist, right? But actually, you believe we ought to have a leadership class in America. It just needs to be a good one, not a rotten one. And so I'm wondering if you can unpack that tension between the sort of legitimate populism that's rising up right now in this country, but also the need for something constructive, not just a, a revolution, but actually new leaders. How do you, how do you think about that tension? Um, I mean, there are many, many, th I would just say to, to answer the last part first, I think the people currently in charge need to be scared into backing off. I just need to be clear. I, I don't think this is like, it's gonna work like, oh, listen, I've got a better idea. No, no, there needs to be pushback, that wakes them up, we've gone too far, we've really transgressed, we've, this is too much. Um, no, I'm hardly a populist, my gosh, there's no society in history. It, it, it's a, look, there's always a leadership class, there's always a small number of people who make the bulk of decisions. It's a matter of, of two things. One, you know, in a democracy, the average person should have some power, shouldn't be completely powerless, labor has no value now, right, so the average, middle-class person doesn't have any economic power, again, because labor has no value. I see Joe Biden with the UAW, and I was like, it's a joke. It's a joke. The, that union's a joke, but, but the whole idea that the working man can do anything is, like, silly. And so the only power the average person has in our country is political, is voting. And if all of a sudden you make it super clear that that's fake, and I think we made it, we couldn't be clearer about it, um, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Either the election will be rigged, that's real, or it is real, sorry, um, or whoever you vote for is gonna do the same thing anyway, uh, then you set the stage for something really ugly, a, a, a revolutionary response. I mean, my view actually is to prevent populism by having better leadership. Hmm. So it's not, and, and I am especially mad about it since it, I'm not sort of like guessing about this. I spent my whole life with these people. I grew up with them and I spent my professional life for 35 years in Washington, D.C. with them. So it's not like I'm, you know, thinking, wow, it seems pretty crazy there. It's like I know firsthand because I know the people involved. Hunter Biden was my next-door neighbor, as I told you. So uh, I'm very, very mad. It's very personal. They hate me. I'm glad. And I just feel like if you have authority, if you have power, and this is where I am very Protestant, like you do have a special obligation to try to help people to whom much is given, much is expected. I really believe that. I really believe, I, I hate to say it, no blessed oblation, I really believe that. Hmm. Buy the housekeeper a new car, it's your duty. And so if you're running an the richest country in history and you're stealing it all for yourself and the main cause of death between the ages of 18 and 44 is suicide and the second is fentanyl OD, that's, that's a sign that you know, you've really failed. I'm sorry, it is. And I'm super mad about it. Hmm. So when we were, we were chatting on the phone before the event a few weeks ago, and just so you know, Linda, all my compliments to you were sincere, because I was talking with Tucker about how you embody this sense of both the, the love of high culture, but also this connection with ordinary people. And as I was describing this to you, uh, you said, well, you know, the reason that this doesn't exist anymore is because of status anxiety. Yes. Among the, can you unpack that? I started writing and I well, was I have blown away. so many theories, some of which are forbidden and naughty, but um, they're real. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think the turnover, it's just, like, we've just had all these massive changes in American society. And I think a lot of people who currently have positions of authority are worried, are very anxious about preserving them. And so, for example, there is this weird taboo, it is not weird actually, it does make a kind of sense, uh, about expressing any kind of sympathy or affection for the white working class. Like, why is that? I mean, or any worker, but it's particularly the white working class. And I happen to live among them, so I, I, I see it a lot. But like the one thing you could never say in Georgetown when I was a kid is like, you know, you could feel sorry for everybody in the most obscure, you know, orphans of Bhutan. But like the Arch Archie Bunker world was like, they deserve to die. And now of course they are dying and that's not accidental at all. They were left to die and their deaths were hastened, I think by leadership class that really hates them. And it's like, why, what'd they do wrong? Anyway, at best they were like chewed with their mouths open or something, but like they didn't actually commit any real sins. And I think that a lot of people in our leadership class are like, 
It's almost like seeing a first cousin you didn't grow up with who is like taking a different path. Anyone who has first, I have this, who's like first cousins that are just like very different from you and you run into them and you're like, ooh, there's something awful about it. They kind of look like you, but they're different. It's one of the, re- it's almost like certain simians freak us out because they have like human eyes. They're just too close. And so I, I think in order to lead, you need to be secure, both with yourself, you need to have an ordered personal life and an ordered stable family. I think it's absolutely essential. I would never hire, I would never take life advice from someone whose children hated him. I wouldn't. Why would I? Do you know, would you, would, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Would you take real estate advice from a homeless person? No. <laughs> so um, I, I think they are very caught up in like things that don't matter at all, like dumb credentials and what stupid school you went to. No offense, I don't care. That's immaterial. What I care about is what you produce. I care about the fruits of the tree. And they don't. And uh, so they're very anxious people and very loathsome. So the interest of honest conversation, uh, I'm curious. So, you know, we're here, we have the founders of the conservative movement with us in this room. And I'm wondering for your vantage point in your own lifetime, what you would assess as the most profound accomplishment of the conservative movement and also the biggest blind spot that you have seen over the past 30, 40 years? Um, I mean, it's changed so much. I mean, I, I would have told you five years ago the biggest blind spot was just assessing the real world effects of economic policies you think are gonna work. And just to be clear, I'm a free market guy, I'm for lower taxes, I'm for less regulation. But I just think, I'm for those things because I think they produce more human happiness. And five years ago I would have said the the conservative firmament in Washington doesn't pay enough attention to that, but I think they do now. Mm -hmm. Actually, Heritage has spent a lot of time on this under Kevin and I'm really grateful to see it. I mean, the biggest failure of the conservative movement is the world that we have now, none of which is conservative, and it's getting more left-wing by the day. The biggest success of the conservative movement is, is persisting and existing. It's still here, which is kind of incredible, given the firepower brought to bear against it. And it's so important for there to be an intellectual option to the tiny suite of options available to your average young person. Like, I just can't get over how narrow and stultifying their program is. It's like, whine about your identity. Whine about your identity. It's like, they're not offering anything. Live alone, childless, in some drywall-clad pod in a big crime-ridden city and work for some stupid bank until you die. (laughs) But you get weed! Whoa! Really? (laughs) Yes, and we have DoorDash! (laughs) No way! Yeah, that's the future they're promising. So, I mean, they don't actually have a lot to offer. And I think the, cons- the, the institutional conservative movement, Heritage, ISI, some others that haven't totally disgraced themselves like AEI, um, which has really disgraced itself in my opinion. Um, I don't know if I was clear enough about that. Uh, <laughs> but the, the few that persist in kind of trying to defend Western civilization, they offer a real option. And I just know from the ISI kids rotating through my office, I mean, cheap labor, (laughs) but um, we did exploit them. But I know that there's like some random kid in some random town who hears about somebody's like, wait, what's that? What's that? And then he winds up at ISI or Heritage or, or other institutions on the right and learns more and his life has changed and America's improved. It's always worth telling the truth, even if you feel like nobody's listening. Every prophet was vindicated in the end throughout the Hebrew Bible, every single one. And a lot of them got stoned to death. In fact, I think the majority. But again, they were like, I mean, do you know how Jeremiah's neighbors felt about him? Loathing. (laughs) Now we revere him. So it's just, it's worth telling the truth no matter what. So two, two challenges facing America. Obviously, at home, we have a massive administrative state, which has rendered basically our republic unrecognizable from what it would have been 100 years ago. Yes. Second, you know, on the, on the world stage, we have America extended in endless wars, but we also have the real threat of a rising China uh, and the situation in Ukraine. So what I'm wondering about is 
at a fundamental level, is America an empire? And if so, when did it become an empire? And is it possible to restore our republic without destroying our prosperity and power? I mean, because I, I mean, everyone's fluent in this language, so obviously empires destroy republics, obviously. Um, and so you don't, you don't want an empire. We've never admitted that we have one. What, how many military bases, Victoria? You would know this. How many military bases, how many military countries do we have a military presence around the world? 120, okay. Yeah, not an empire. Um, <laughs> you know, by the way, there are good things about empires. Keeping the trade routes open, I think, is essential. Um, we've used it, uh, you know, the, the fact that we have the unique privilege of possessing the world's reserve currency has made 33 trillion in, in debt possible. I mean, there, you know, there have been upsides, I would say, but it does tend to rot your republic. Um, I, I, was, I, I spent the last four months traveling around the world because I was trapped in a studio for like decades. And though we'd go to Europe in the summer for a week, I, I haven't traveled in like 20 years. I haven't really just spent months on the road going to different places. And so I've been to a bunch of continents, interviewed a lot of people, some off camera, mostly to answer the question, what does the world look like beyond America? And geography, I still believe, even in 2023, defines people's worldview and defines geopolitics. I mean, where you live matters. Hmm. And in fact, it's, it's all important. So um, I still think, despite the digital revolution. And I, I discovered a million things, I'm not gonna be boring, but I'll just say in one sentence, the perception of America and of the world outside our borders hmm. is so different from the perception within our borders that it raises a lot of questions, like really very serious questions about our ability to know things I mean, our media, you pro I'm sure every person in this room distrusts the media and thinks they lied to you. Man, you go, go to the Middle East, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, anywhere. I've been to all those places recently. It's crazy the things they know that we don't. And I'll just give you one example. I, I, whenever you think of the war against Russia or the war in Ukraine, um, and I'm, I don't want to debate it, or, and I think everyone involved most people on both sides have good intentions. I'm not attacking anybody. If you've got views opposite mine, it doesn't make you a traitor or a bad person in my view. Honest people reach different conclusions very often, including there. However, every person in America who I ever met was convinced for the first year and a half that Ukraine was winning, was on its way to winning. We just need to send more material and they would win. The view for the rest of the world is like, that's insane because they're looking at the fundamentals. It's not even a political question. Russia has 100 million more people than Ukraine. Russia is the largest landmass in the world. Russia has some of the deepest energy reserves on planet Earth, and Russia also has massive industrial capacity. And Ukraine has none of those things. What? And you're telling me, with the help of NATO, which doesn't actually exist in the sense that most Americans think that it does, is going to beat Russia? I mean, however much you may fervently want that, that's not going to happen, and I can promise you that no smart person outside our borders ever for one second thought that was gonna happen, and yet every person I know, including very smart foreign policy wonks, <laughs> had somehow convinced themselves it was gonna happen. Now, what that suggests to me is a systemic problem where we're not capable of reaching obvious conclusions about things anymore, and that's death. Hmm. Like, ideology aside, opinions aside, if you can't even assess basic, like Wikipedia-level information, Who's got the advantage? A hundred million more people? Okay. Oh, they're gonna, they're gonna lose. They're gonna topple Putin. Um, it makes, that makes me really worry. Not just the decisions we're making, but the way that we're making them concerns me a lot. We have time for one more question, and all of you actually have a copy in your gift bag of Tucker's book, The Long Slide. And it is an autographed copy. What? Um, it's autographed. So I've, I've seen he's been signing some books. If you actually flip the page over, his signature's already there. You can still come up and say hi, no, no. Um, so this is a reflection on 30 years in journalism and yep. some of the pieces you've published. So one really long question, and that is a short one. Uh, how has journalism changed <laughs> over the course of your lifetime? But then lastly, and th maybe you could address this to our ISI students and campus journalists. What would you say to a young investigative reporter at one of our campus newspapers who wants to be the next Tucker Carlson. 
Um, how has it changed? I mean, well, my dad was a journalist. That's why I went into journalism. My great-grandfather was a journalist. We're in the Dallas Morning News. Um, so I grew up in a world where, you know, people read books and told stories about places they'd been and amazing things they'd seen and remarkable people they'd interviewed. And, and the whole goal in my house growing up with my dad and my brother was to lead an interesting life. And that was my goal when I started. It was not to, like, tell the truth to power or whatever. I never, that never occurred to me. I mean, I felt like, I don't know, I was from a world that was in power. I didn't need to tell the truth to power. I believed in the world I was in, and that had no role in my conception of journalism. I just wanted to see interesting stuff and meet interesting people. I just wanted at the end to be like, yeah, I had a really interesting life. Grandpa's an interesting guy. That was my whole goal. And, but the one thing I knew about journalism was, in the end, the journalist is the guy who gets to give the finger to the king. Like, that's your job. And you had to be fearless. And my father and my great-grandfather were fearless guys, tough people, for real, like legit. And um, I wrote about my dad in there, tough human being. So um, it's so different from that now. I mean, of course, it's just a Praetorian guard that exists to protect hedge fund managers and Kamala Harris. I mean, it's, it's literally their job is to take the people with the most power and attack you for criticizing them. Well, I'm not never asking some, some well, I've had so many debates about this, but like, and I'm just gonna offend people, but it's just a question I asked once, which is, if we're for work, then why do we tax work at twice the rate of capital? Why do we do that? And I have investments, I'm against raising capital gains rates or whatever, but like, it, it is a statement of value, right? We, we tax Marlboro Red, honestly, a great cigarette, because we don't want you to smoke them. You know, in Scandinavia, a quart of vodka is 60 bucks because all the Scandinavians are drunks and they know it. They don't want them to drink. So we're, we're taxing labor at twice the rate of capital. What does that tell you? We don't want you to work. So I raised this point once to somebody who immediately called me a communist. I was like, I don't think I'm a communist. Uh, and then I raised it on TV and immediately got called a racist. <laughs> racist! All right. So that kind of gives away the whole game right there. And by the way, just to be clear, I know I'm making everyone uncomfortable. I'm not calling for raising capital gains rates, but I would like to see parity between the two, because why wouldn't you? I mean, that's insane, actually, if you think about it. It's very offensive. And by the way, trust me, that along with high gas prices is one of the single most offensive things to people in lower income zip codes. But the, me the media never raised these questions. They never raised basic economic questions ever. And they attack anybody who does. And moreover, they protect some of the worst people in the world from scrutiny because they have power. That is like a complete, like, it's like a scientific inversion. That's like an x-ray of what journalism is supposed to be. Um, and the last thing I'll say, which brings me great sadness, I've thought about it many times, is I have four children, one son, who's a big reader and smarter than I am, and he, all my kids, three of them went to the same college, Decent college, so he finishes college, and I, you know, I take him fishing because you're not looking at each other, so you can talk. And I say, you know, what, you know, have you considered journalism? This is like spring of his senior year, and he's like, well, and I said, you know, it's like multiple. You've been fourth generation in our family, like it's an honorable thing. And he's like, no, I don't think so. I was like, no journalism at all. He goes, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but they lie, and they're losers. And I was like, no, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> just, just devoted my life to it, okay. Um, and of course, it did hurt my feelings. I said, what are you gonna do? He goes, I wanna go into politics. I was like, really? You're choosing politics over journalism? And he's like, there's less lying. It's just super straightforward. Vote for my guy. I'm not like showing up being like, I'm the protector of the downtrodden and then like flacking for Sam Bankman fried You know what I mean? Which is the whole media. And so he went in that direction, and honestly, that right there just tells you, like, if your kids aren't continuing the life that you lived, voluntarily, choosing not to do the things that you did, it says a lot about you and what you did, doesn't it? Yeah. So I can't say I regret anything, but if I had to do it again, I, I, I don't know, I'd probably sell asbestos or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or Pedal chewing tobacco to children or something a little bit more popular and honorable. 
you know? Your kid ever tried Copenhagen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're, uh, <laughs> We're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're actually going to end there. <laughs> Let's give it up for Tucker Carlson. Thank, Thank you. you. It was so awesome. fun. No.